Doom Eternal is the epitome of game design. That's a hell of a statement to make when compared to the rest of 2020's titles such as Hades and The Last of Us 2, let alone all of gaming history. On every conceivable gameplay front, Eternal manages to coalesce a shattering magnitude of mechanics into a perfect amalgamation of cohesive design that uses every single element to actively push players into its intended design of strategic close-range carnage, adapting to dynamic landscape of contexts and resource management. Variables such as platforming, enemy variety, weapons, mods, grenades, blood punches, dashing, chainsawing, and glory kills don't meld together to forge a chaotic and incomprehensible wreckage, but to conduct a carefully orchestrated symphony of death. Eternal holds its rightful throne within the echelon of game design by the virtue of a clearly defined gameplay loop that is subtly conveyed to players via offensive capabilities and resource opportunities. Despite receiving multiple nominations from 2020's Game Awards, Eternal failed to garner a single victory. This isn't meant to lambast any group or individual that doesn't share the same tastes or opinions. It's beyond absurd to assert that any given singular person should play or enjoy every title of the year. My own podcast, Game Session, failed to earn Eternal a single victory during our award show, directly due to the fact that my panelists' tastes aren't geared towards shooters. Eternal's greatest and admittedly simplest diversions from the contemporary shooter landscape is retaining its boomer shooter roots that its precursor burst over 27 years ago. For the uneducated, boomer shooters place an emphasis on relentless breakneck movements, high accuracy hip fire, limited health, dodging enemy attacks, and a perpetually available arsenal of weapons. Contemporary shooters instead opt to focus on regenerating health, a limited arsenal, and only allowing for higher movement speeds at the cost of sacrificing your ability to attack. Contrasting these two schools of thought easily yields game design ramifications. Eternal pushes players into a gameplay loop of using their speed to attack with pinpoint accuracy, aggressively running towards demons to farm resources, adapting to a wide number of consistently changing variables, and weaving through the bullet hell onslaught of enemy projectiles. Modern shooters, on the other hand, drive users to take a slow and methodical approach, sticking to cover and taking pot shots to garner slow but gradual progress. In terms of pure disparity from the rest of the Doom franchise, Eternal enhances its boomer shooter foundation by sowing a slew of new mechanics and enriching the entrenched roots of the progenitor genre by motivating players to engage in close quarters combat. Glory kills are contact sensitive melee finishers that the player is only able to take advantage of once a sufficient amount of damage has been dealt to an enemy. The immediate benefit of utilizing glory kills is instantly removing a foe from the battlefield. However, the more critical payoff is a cluster of health that is quite literally ripped out of demons. The benefits of glory kills is instantaneously translucent to players, as they foundationally absorb that glory kills are a centerpiece of the gameplay loop that they need to continually engage with in order to wreak havoc and ensure their own survival. However, there's two catches to being able to employ the usage of glory kills. Players only have a limited window of availability, and they need to be in close proximity to enemies. These two factors drive towards the same destination. You need to be close to enemies at all times if you have even the faintest desire to successfully execute this core game mechanic. Alongside this, strategic players will adapt to strategies specifically tailored to glory kills, such as opting to farm mobs of weaker foes before tackling more difficult challenges. A nice bonus from glory kills, aside from the dopamine rush inducing viscera, is the ever so brief break from the gameplay loop, which gives you a fleeting opportunity to reset and evaluate your next course of action. A new addition to Eternal is the Flame Belch, which unlike the former, relies on a cooldown rotation instead of specific contexts. Flame Belch is a short-range flamethrower that not only provides a small amount of damage against foes, but turns any incoming casualties they receive into armor resources for the player. The Flame Belch continues to hammer in that combat needs to take place up close and personal, with the added gameplay loop of utilizing cooldown abilities at every possible opportunity. In the same cooldown vein are the frag and freeze grenades, which add another layer of AoE offensive capabilities that add to your active arsenal of destruction. While frags are a self-explanatory utility, freeze grenades grant multiple coats of strategy, allowing for players to temporarily isolate foes, as well as marking them with a damage multiplier. 
effective players will create decimating chains, such as freezing bigger foes before blasting them with a flame belt, frag grenades, and a barrage of shotgun shells. This strategy alone is a go-to method of efficiently dispatching most foes without them ever having the opportunity to strike back. This method is all the more productive since it eliminates threats players face from utilizing high-risk, high-reward weapons such as the Super Shotgun. The Chainsaw returns in all of its insta-kill glory, but its true purpose and utility stems from its ability to replenish the Slayer's ammunition. The Chainsaw naturally regenerates a single fuel pip over time, ensuring that economical players will consistently have a contingency plan of carving mob enemies to shreds in order to reset their murder spree capabilities. While other fuel resources can be hoarded to decimate larger demons, it's imperative that the chainsaw is an emergency plan, not the first line of defense. There's an incredibly migraine-inducing reset era thread in which users assert that Internal's core gameplay loop and design is outright poorly constructed, with specific criticism levied at the perceived lack of ammo leaving players with nothing to fight with. This desperate need for aspirin branches from the fact that Eternal not only explicitly provides a text tutorial explaining the mechanics of the chainsaw, but it then requires players to utilize the mechanic themselves three times in a row to ingrain its purpose. In terms of the gameplay loop, it's solidified that the chainsaw is the tail end of the Ouroboros that feeds the mouth of the next wave of destruction. This is reinforced on a constant basis, and Eternal's comparatively sparse ammo allocation entices players into engaging with this loop, which in turn cements the core tenet of the constant close quarters carnage and resource farming. But we'd be remiss to forget about one of the most deadly abilities at the Slayer's disposal, the Blood Punch. The Blood Punch is a devastating melee attack that can rip and tear enemies and their armaments apart with an accompanying AoE pulse that shreds nearby standers. The catch to being able to utilize the Blood Punch is that it's earned, not handed out on a cooldown basis. Players will need to perform two glory kills in order to earn a Blood Punch charge, further encouraging aggressive close-range encounters while adding another layer of resource management that requires enemies to be carefully managed instead of outright blasted to pieces. Utilizing your equipment on a consistent basis in conjunction with one another is imperative to your success in Eternal. While this aspect has proven a hurdle for some, following through on its successful execution provides players with a euphoric flow unlike anything else on the market. This isn't a Call of Duty or store brand cover shooter where optimal strategies entail taking pot shots and waiting for your health to regenerate. Eternal mandates that you charge headstrong into the heat of battle and earn every ounce of the massacre. Eternal is simply able to provide an experience that no other game on the market is able to provide. The game is repeatedly providing an impetus to engage in its core game design by providing an abundance of rewards for doing so. And we haven't even delved into the dashing or parkour, both of which open up entirely new avenues of offensive and defensive capabilities alike. Dashes allow for last second hair splitting dodges against projectiles and melee assaults, as well as allowing for the Slayer to expedite gaps between them and their prey. Parkour takes up an extensive portion of Eternal, as it provides a myriad of combat opportunities and entirely unique platforming sections that supply their own exclusive form of challenges. This appears to be a contentious sticking point for players that are unaccustomed to first-person platforming, but the level design accounts for the inherent perspective limitations of the first-person view by never requiring immediate action towards platforms outside of your immediate cone of vision. The platforming adds a divergent puzzle element into Eternal, especially when you account for the plethora of hidden collectibles and upgrades strewn across levels which creates an entirely unique layer of exploration gameplay. Players can surely opt out of finding these collectibles and scouring the environment, but by doing so, they're actively limiting their demon killing potential, and you'll be hard pressed to find users that will outright ignore this nudge from the game design. As with any shooter, the Slayer's arsenal is pivotal to the entirety of the experience. Each weapon succeeds in its own right as an individual instrument with unique strengths, weaknesses, and utility. But when composed with one another and employing the aforementioned motifs of design, they orchestrate a ballad unlike any other. 
Each weapon serves a particular purpose, with their utility expandable by entirely unique weapon mods that allow for completely divergent playstyles that players will either settle into as their default choice, or adapt to on the fly as required by the ever-changing hellscape. As the introductory weapon, the combat shotgun constructs the foundation of the player's understanding of Eternal's combat. It's taught in this fetal stage that the optimal range for damage is up close and personal, and that this proximity to enemies reaps the aforementioned benefits of glory kills and resource farming. The combat shotgun's weapon mods provide two entirely distinct means of tactical utility, with a sticky grenade launcher allowing for long-range AoE damage with the capability to destroy enemy armaments, while the full auto mod allows for an insane DPS output. The former hammers in the importance of disarming foes by introducing the Arachnatron, with players being instructed that they can destroy the demon's turret with a well-placed grenade to make the remainder of the fight infinitely easier. This utility is made even clearer with Cacodemons, as lobbing grenades into the demon's mouth will open it up for an immediate glory kill. Even if the player chooses to utilize the latter mod as their go-to weapon of destruction, the game design reinforces that specific verbs yield beneficial combat opportunities, and that players need to adapt to any given situation with a tool best suited for the job. It's also important to note that the grenade launcher, along with other explosives, outright obliterates mob enemies, which consequently results in less health resources than a glory kill. While an effective means to wreak havoc, this mod, if used uneconomically, will deprive you of offensive opportunities and chances to fortify your defenses. The same can be said for the range at which the launcher allows the Slayer to rain death upon foes from, as keeping distance between enemies is counterintuitive to the central game design. On the opposite end of the spectrum, and shortly introduced after the combat shotgun, is a long-ranged heavy assault rifle. Its base fire requires far more accuracy than the broad stroke of the shotgun, so with enemies running across environments, the rifle's optimal range still lies in the close to medium range. In addition to this, the time to kill is significantly higher than the combat shotgun, effectively making it a mere substitution to the former when its munitions run dry. This in of itself places importance on the shotgun as the first line of offense, which as a result solidifies their reliance on close-range engagements. The Micro Missiles mod strikes away the need for accuracy, as the homing nature of the salvo allows for players to sweep entire rooms of mobs from a central position. This, however, isn't necessarily viable as a primary primary means of attack until the weapon challenge for the bottomless missiles is acquired, as prior to its acquisition the recharge period will leave you with the weapon's pea shooter of a primary fire. As the only ADS tool in your arsenal, the precision bolt allows players to scope into enemies to destroy armaments and inflict critical damage to weak points. The downside stems from its lack of practicality, as demons are often moving too hastily to be properly targeted. While the Precision Bolt is certainly a useful mod, especially against the Makers, Eternal simply isn't designed as a Call of Duty shooter, and employing those tactics won't work alongside all the previously mentioned elements and incentives. The Plasma Rifle is the first weapon in the Slayer's arsenal that serves as a projectile firearm instead of a hitscan one, meaning that the physical object outputted from the gun needs to make contact with enemies. The hitscan weapon, on the other hand, registers as soon as players pull the trigger, making them far more reliable. This inherent projectile nature requires players to account for another layer of strategy in which they need to lead their shots to ensure that they reach their target. In an even greater case than the heavy assault rifle, the plasma gun reaches its optimal output at close to medium range encounters to mitigate its projectile nature. The heat blast mod allows for the Slayer to slowly accumulate energy as they shoot with the plasma gun. This player has been able to unleash a close AoE blast at three different thresholds with corresponding levels of strength. Due to this close range AoE nature, risk averse players will submerge themselves in the center of hordes in order to achieve the greatest amount of carnage. Strategic players can ration the mod and save it for bigger foes, or even preemptively waste shots to build up the heat blast. This wasting process can be effectively circumvented by immediately following up with a chainsaw slice and negate the sunk cost. On the other hand, the Microwave Beam mod locks and stuns a singular foe, with the demon exploding once enough ammunition has been dumped into the process. While efficient at locking singular enemies down, it suffers from two drawbacks. In addition to leaving you incapable of attacking other foes, the Microwave Beam doesn't deal actual damage until a threshold explosion. Failure to properly assess the amount of resources needed to reach the threshold will only result in a complete loss of time and ammunition. The rocket launcher continues the trend of physical projectiles, with the slow-moving rockets requiring players to not only lead their shots, but to predict where enemies are going to be. 
The Remote Detonate mod directly alleviates this inherent projectile challenge by allowing the Slayer to manually and prematurely detonate rockets, adding another layer of timing and AoE placement. As is the case with previous descriptors and entailed consequences, rockets deprive you of mob glory kill opportunities and generally aren't efficient at long range. The lock-on burst remedies the latter issue, as rockets are transformed into a homing missile barrage with a higher DPS output than the former mod. Where the remote detonate excels in taking out groups of weaker foes, the unrelenting nature of the lock-on burst is tailored to taking out more challenging individuals. Out of any of the weapons at this point, the hard 50-50 split utility of the rocket launcher is exemplary of the need to continually swap mods based on the context that you find yourself in. It's worth noting that the remaining weapons utilize the same ammunition sources as their counterparts, meaning that while players may find a steady default that they have a strong preference for, they'll still need to improvise a way from their cemented course of action as needed. The Ballista is a hard-hitting sniper-like beam that requires greater accuracy from players, but it serves as an excellent counter to the plasma rifle's close-range limiting projectiles and accumulate damage over time. This high burst capacity makes the Ballista one of the best tools to utilize against marauders, who only have a fleeting moment of vulnerability. While both of the Ballista's mods provide it with devastating results, their central drawback stems from handicapping the Slayer's movement speed to a crawl. In a game where constant movement is mandatory, this is the epitome of a high-risk, high-reward scenario. The Arbalist mod allows the initial shot to be accompanied by a secondary blast that immediately decimates Cacodemons, making the Ballista one of the most important weapons to swap to. The Destroyer Blade, on the other hand, is able to decimate entire rooms of enemies if timed properly. Skillful players can start the charging process mid-air, thereby mitigating some of the movement loss. The chain gun utilizes the same munitions as the heavy assault rifle, with its mods allowing for either defensive shield capabilities or pure unrivaled DPS output that can shred even the toughest of demons, albeit by ransacking your ammunition at a steady rate. With the precision bolt of the rifle being relegated to contextual situations and the micro-missiles being best suited to eliminating mobs, the chain gun takes the throne is a DPS behemoth crafted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against even the largest of foes. The Super Shotgun Fall's eternal central thesis of constant movement and close quarters combat to an absolute perfection. Its comically absurd damage output forces you to forego safety as you charge and sling yourself headlong into danger. Combined with chains and dodging, the Super Shotgun allows for the complete obliteration of anything that crosses your path. It's undoubtedly a high-risk weapon to use against anything comparable to or bigger than a Mancubus, but when combined with evasive maneuvers, it's well worth the investment. Due to its double-barreled nature, the Super Shotgun suffers from being an incredible ammo sink, effectively making it less economical to use against mob enemies as its predecessor. Players like myself that are reluctant to abandon the allure of the superior boomstick will need to adapt to be smarter with their chainsaw usage. Unlike the other weapons in your toolbox, the Super Shotgun doesn't have any mods to swap between. Instead, you're greeted with a meat hook, a long-range hookshot-like tool that latches on enemies and sends a slayer propelling headlong into them, preparing them for a shotgun blast directly in their face. This circumvents the Super Shotgun's inherent long-range disadvantage, transforming it into a tool that gives you every advantage and incentive you need to engage in the game's central thesis. Each of these weapons add their own layer of unique gameplay mechanics, strategies, and specific use case scenarios. They're all available to you at any given time, and it's up to you to decide what brushes you want to use to paint a picture. It's also worth noting that the optional weapon challenges repeatedly push players to utilize each mod's strength, illustrating through first-hand experience how to properly yield each tool. All of these verbs would be left unsatiated if the only source of resistance were generic fodder. Instead, Eternal uses uses a wide variety of demons to prompt players to improvise to each foe's unique set of challenges. Soldiers serve as a foundational building block for a newcomer's understanding of Eternal's game design, as their slow-firing projectiles and movement speed make them ripe targets for the Slayer to maneuver around. Imps evolve this dynamic between player and enemy by using their agility to both evade and launch attacks of their own, forcing players to maintain spatial awareness of where the pests are running towards. The imp's central attack is an easily telegraphed fireball that shoots out at a blistering speed, 
providing players with ample opportunities to become better at dodging fast projectiles. The mobility and speed at which imps attack are its greatest assets, and it forces players to remain in a perpetual state of locomotion in order to evade and land blows of their own. Arachnotrons and Cacodemons, as previously mentioned, are the earliest instances of Eternal explicitly explaining to players that they need to adapt to specific enemies with corresponding tactics and equipment, and that doing so early on in a fight will yield easier encounters and offensive opportunities. Following this train of specific weapons serving as hard counters to demons, Maker Drones are easily dispatched with a single headshot from a precision bolt, which results in a plethora of health, armor, and ammo resources. Carcasses utilize energy shields to both mitigate damage and block off the player's avenues of attack. These shields are easily countered by overloading them with your plasma gun, resulting in a devastating AoE blast that tears nearby foes to shreds. Mancubuses, as well as their beefier cyber counterparts, are tank-like behemoths that can launch powerful long-range salvos, in addition to devastating close-range AoE outbursts that afflict the ground for a given period of time. Strategic players can opt to eliminate their armaments from a distance, as well as utilize their mastery of movement and dodging to circumvent their short-range capabilities. Pinkies are near and vulnerable when shot head-on, forcing players to dodge their bull charge and fire upon their soft backsides. Cooldown conscientious players can bypass the initial pinky charge by freezing them, leaving the demon completely defenseless and open to death at your nearest convenience. Spectres, the Pinky's invisible counterparts, serve the same role with the additional necessity of maintaining an even greater sense of situational awareness in order to detect them. Hell Knights are slow but heavy-hitting melee demons with a complementary, powerful but easily telegraphed projectile, making them the perfect target to outmaneuver. Dread Knights, the polar opposite of the former, are squishy but highly mobile foes capable of unleashing a flurry of blade attacks that should be kept at a distance. The Baron of Hell takes the strengths of the two knights to form a speedy and melee-oriented tank. You'll need to maintain a constant output of DPS, dashing, and parkour in order to fend them off, with players utilizing effective chains of burst damage able to finish them off before they even get a chance to strike back. Buff totems, while not a direct threat, are able to empower an arena's enemies with increased speed, health, and damage output. A buff totem's existence within a combat space immediately reinforces a new primary goal to players. The totem needs to be eliminated as soon as possible. All other enemies and priorities fall by the wayside as long as the totem still stands, with arenas meant for combat turning into obstacle courses as you dodge and weave through foes in search of the source of their empowerment. While initially a boss, the Doom Hunter regularly appears throughout levels as a normal enemy that's capable of a wide range of close and long range attacks. The Doom Hunter's unique property is ostensibly having a second health bar meaning spreading your carnage across two separate hunters is inefficient, and that eliminating one outright should be your primary goal. Pain elementals are an even tougher variety of cacodemons, with the caveat of spawning lost souls and being invulnerable to the grenade setup that their lessers suffer from. As with the cacodemons, pain elementals take bonus damage from the ballista's arbalist, making it the go-to weapon for nearly every singular encounter with them. Archviles provide the same gameplay loop as buff totems, as their incessant spawning of enemies easily places them at the top of the priority hierarchy. However, unlike the buff totem, the Archvile is more than able to defend itself with an impenetrable inferno wall and streaks of fire to blaze you to a smoldering ember. The Archvile is readily aware of the fact that an endless wave of enemies will spawn as long as it exists on the field as it will repeatedly teleport to hide itself and preserve the drove of demons. On the opposite side of the coin are Prowlers, demons that rely on their insistent teleportation abilities to sneak upon the Slayer in a disorienting barrage of hide-and-seek guerrilla tactics. Maintaining a constant sense of spatial awareness is a must, with high burst damage and lock-on weapons serving as the perfect counter. Whiplashes are one of the more evasive foes you'll face, as their serpentine movements make precision weapons an absolute bust in comparison to AoE and lock-on tactics. Cyber demons, or tyrants as Eternal refers to them, are absolutely colossal foes that take up an enormous physical space in arenas and force you to adapt to hit and run tactics to avoid being obliterated by their attacks. Cyber demons are often accompanied by an endless wave of mob enemies that exist purely for the player to mine them for resources, effectively turning these battles into ones where the Slayer is making bombing runs with their highest method of DPS before refilling their munitions as needed. 
In regards to farming for ammo, it's imperative to note that the chainsaw still needs to recharge between producing cadavers, meaning players will need to cycle through the majority of their weapon wheel in adapting the strategies as needed. This design stands in pale contrast to the, lack of better words, T-Rex battle in Resident Evil 6, which only gives a limited source of munitions to find within the environment. Let the challenge stem from being able to kill the boss not whether you'll run out of the resources necessary to even accomplish the task. The Marauder is unique in that it can only be damaged as it launches a specific charge attack with its axe. Thankfully, the game clearly states as such within the introductory tutorial. The Marauder can be stated as entirely antithetical to how the Doom Slayer approaches enemy encounters, as it forces you to stop and wait for opportunities instead of launching an unending salvo of attacks. The lack of offensive chances forces the Slayer into the role of the Hunted, with the majority of the fight spent dodging the Marauder's attacks while maintaining a consistent line of sight to ensure that you don't miss your window. The caveat to getting the Marauder to launch this specific lunge is maintaining a medium range proximity at any given time, as entering its personal space will greet you with shotgun blasts, and giving too wide a berth delivers a wave of projectiles. And just to add another layer of strategy, the Marauder is able to summon a spirit dog to nip at your heels, distracting you from more lethal attacks. It's imperative that you don't waste the rare opportunities to damage the Marauder. Its high DPS over time weapons like the Chain Gun won't be able to inflict as much damage as burst weapons like the Super Shotgun and Ballista within the fleeting window of vulnerability. The Marauder is relentless in its assault, and its ability to completely flip the script against the player's preconceived notions of how to tackle encounters makes it one of the best enemies within the game. Each enemy within Eternal is entirely unique in their strengths, weaknesses, limitations, and how they force players to adapt to new tactics and strategies. Combining all of these variables together alongside the core design tenet creates a near endless torrent of possibilities for players to tackle. Eternal's DLC, The Ancient Gods Part 1, takes everything that was already extraordinary about the base game and amplifies it tenfold with an increased emphasis on bigger hordes of simultaneous foes, challenging encounters overflowing with tougher varieties of demons, excellent enemy placement, and the best boss battles to ever grace a first-person shooter. The new spirit enemy strength lies in its ability to possess regular enemies and empower their stats through the stratosphere, transforming them into literal speed demons with tank-like health and nuclear levels of damage output. You might think you have a sturdy handle on how to tackle Barons of Hell, but all of that gets tossed out the window when it's bombarding you with an unyielding assault that you can't escape via freeze chains. Even when you manage to defeat the possessed demon, the spear can only be finished off by specifically utilizing the plasma rifle's microwave beam mod in a Ghostbusters-like fashion. Going into encounters with the spear adds another layer of resource management to the already existing challenges specific to the microwave beam. As the only weapon at your disposal capable of finishing the job, Tactical players will have to avoid using energy weapons for the duration of the fight until the spirit appears. There's only a fleeting window of opportunity to slay the exposed spirit, so players need to strike while the iron is hot. There's no time for last minute chainsawing to replenish your energy munitions. Spirits that aren't slain in time will proceed to jump into new demons, thereby setting players back to square one in an encounter where they were already struggling in. Strategies to counteract this include eliminating substantial foes from the battlefield before moving on to the possessed demon, effectively cutting off the spirit's escape plan aside from weak mobs. This strategy, however, faces the turbulence of allowing the spirit to constantly nip at your heels, forcing players to weave through environments to mitigate damage until their plan comes to fruition. And as if this wasn't enough of a gauntlet, our ever so friendly adversary the Marauder comes back with a vengeance from beyond the grave as a possessed demon. The fight against the Spirit Marauder is unlike any other encounter in the game, as the unending drove of mobs are constantly digging their claws into your backside as what is ostensibly a Terminator on steroids is hunting you down. This Marauder is faster, stronger, and sturdier than its normal counterparts. But the trickiest part of the encounter is the fact that its already slim window of vulnerability has been cut in half. The majority of the fight won't even be spent attacking the Marauder, as players are forced to run across the arena fighting off infinitely respawning mobs and mining for scarce resources. 
The window to even attack the Marauder is severely limited, and thanks to its increased speed, it's even rarer to actually land a successful blow. The Ancient Gods loves to toss a metric ton of enemies to the Slayer at the same time, and it's no stranger to simultaneously throwing in multiple heavy hitters that are already singular feats within their own right. I hope you're ready to take on combinations such as two Archviles, two Tyrants, a Doom Hunter, and a Possessed Baron of Hell all at the same time. The developers have gotten equal parts smarter and insidious with their enemy placement, such as putting you into an extremely narrow hallway with a Cyber Demon, which makes any dodging and outmaneuvering strategies completely null and void, as a fight instead turns into inflicting damage as fast as you can before you get obliterated. And there's nothing quite like a door opening and immediately being greeted by a charging marauder directly in your face. And what could possibly be worse than fighting one marauder? How about two marauders? This fight will push you to the absolute brink, with dodging and farming taking up the majority of the battle. The Ancient Gods is easily home to the best FPS boss battles in history, specifically because they require every single aforementioned game design element combined with a persistent reliance on spatial awareness and parkour to avoid damage. It applies a central thesis of what boss battles should be, a test of every single accumulated skill that you've developed on your journey. Doom Eternal is one of the best designed titles in all of gaming history. It has a specific gameplay loop that is conveyed to players through a myriad of offensive and defensive incentives that offers a wide range of verbs to paint whatever bloody picture they desire. Every element ties back to the core of the game's thesis, and its success should be echoed throughout the annals of history.